Hi all, you might be wondering if you should really use the Smith Morrow Gambit. Is it sound enough? In the engine world, has it ever been used? In fact, it has. I have a very interesting game to show you today, uh, which features Ali Steen versus Houdini. Uh, this was played in T-Sex Season 15, the Rapid Bonus. Uh, so slightly faster time control than the, uh, the longer time limits, of course. Uh, so just as a recap, uh, we checked out Mayhem in the Mora, this course at Chessable, which you can find at the link here. And um, so we're going to see from an engine point of view uh, a game now. So this game, Ali Steen is basically, uh, the authors are Adam Treat. And he said, Ali is a very new engine, but represents a lot of hard work over the last several months. And he hopes TSEC can provide an opportunity to, to see how she st stacks up against a host of more established engines. Combining Ali with the Leland Stein network will be interesting, given that um, both introduced new avenues of research in neural network uh, chess engines. Uh, so Adam says he is new to chess programming com uh, community, new to the community and culture, and he's pretty excited to learn uh, through TSEC. Mark Jordan is the co-author and he's excited to see how far an engine that uses supervised learning SL exclusively can go and he hopes there'll be more strong supervised learning networks to compare against benchmarking average performance and maximum performance of this method. So uh, both of them together, Ali is based on the same concepts and algorithms that were introduced by DeepMind in the AlphaZero papers, but her code is original and contains an alternative implementation to those ideas. You can think of Ali as a young cousin of Leela that can utilize the same networks produced by the uh, LC0 project or other compatible networks. So the Leland Stein network also contains a novelty in that it introduces supervised learning into the TSEC competition. Okay, uh, so let's have a look at this game, very interesting game. So the opening book given, E4, C5, so Alistine playing white, Houdini 6.3 playing black. And we get a transposition into the Smith Morrow Gambit. And here is, uh, after D6, this is the end of the book given to them. So is white just a pawn down for nothing? Maybe many of you have been cynical about the Smith Morrow Gambit and think surely an engine like Houdini, which has even beaten Stockfish, would surely crush white a pawn up. Let's see what happened. Alistair castles. Bishop e7, Queen e2. So this is the shaving, shaving England pawn structure, which there are chapters on in Esmond's fantastic book. Uh, so with e6 and d6. Bishop d7 was played here. An alternative which is quite popular is knight f6. But after rook d1, there's an unpleasantness uh, staring on the d file. If black plays e5, it's a compromise. And as Mark in his book emphasizes, this bishop can be really powerful on c4 in this line. Uh, this is an example where uh, the d5 control is good and white ends up slightly better. Here, by the way, is an important tactical trap to be aware of that you can get to play this because if knight takes e4, you can take on g6 and that wins a piece. For example, here it's check and you're a piece up. Or the other way, if bishop takes e4, you just nudge the protection of the bishop with g5 and you end up winning material. If that's the best black can do, that's a disaster for black. So this line with g4 is, is available to white with the idea of knight h4. So this alternative main line to the game uh, is interesting as well. But let's look at the game. So bishop d7. Um, <clears throat> and just sorry by by the way after knight h4 a same move like rook c8 uh, white will be fine after bishop b3 white technically even according to stockfish has a small edge in this position so interesting stuff this bishop is a bit of a prisoner on e7 okay so back to this this features game bishop d7 rook d1 a6 bishop f4 and black is prompted for e5 so is this bishop going to be really strong white is aiming sometimes to get a good grip on d5 and surely you'd think keeping an eye on it or having a piece over it uh, is the normal thing you wouldn't ever want to play e takes right let's see knight f6 in fact knight d5 we have now knight takes d5 uh, and if knight takes e4 this is another trap for the unsuspecting player with the black pieces bishop b6 hits the queen and hits that knight so that would be uh, winning material 
in fact even better is throwing in the check first so knight takes d5 and now uh, bishop takes d5 so that seems logical the principles of positional play the outpost d5 you keep a piece on it generally for outpost squares after casting h3 is played queen e8 knight d2 as if knight c4 is of great interest this b6 square rook c8 knight c4 and actually we have the move knight b4 here if black doesn't do anything white could potentially build up on this d file here this is a very interesting position if for example h6 there is huge compensation to be gained here a3 to rule out knight b4 so that bishop's going to remain intact and white could play like this it's a very dominant position here uh, if black does that then d6 drops but otherwise yeah d6 is going to be in big trouble soon so uh, for example rook g8 and uh, eventually you know this this is just very very comfortable position for white uh, so okay so knight b4 was tried by houdini and now we have bishop takes b7 rook c7 bishop d5 and the idea of snapping this off e takes is played h6 and now b3 white does have a two to one pawn majority here but if white is too quick with it with b4 then there's bishop b5 and this pin basically wins after queen c8 uh, wins material so b3 treading carefully and also supporting the idea of a4 to get rid of bishop b5 as a resource f4 these pawns look dangerously mobile but they're kept, kept in check with f4 so to speak e4 and now a4 taking away b5 uh, can these pawns get going later we have queen b8 rook a b1 queen b4 so black setting up a blockade against this pawn majority on the dark squares we have now bishop d8 king h2 bishop e8 bishop b6 rook d7 queen f2 rook f7 uh, the bishop drops back it doesn't take on d8 perhaps the tension is significantly reduced here white might only have a small edge in the game continuation in fact Alistair soon centralizes this bishop on e3 and makes it look a little bit better than its counterpart as we'll see bishop d4 looking at g7 now it's a nice square to have that bishop on king h7 queen c3 even offering the exchange of queens which will liberate this two to one pawn majority potentially much more easy to liberate that so and in fact queen takes c3 was played by houdini and we have now g3 g5 the rooks double bishop d7 h4 trying to kind of uh, resolve things over here trying to lock things down reduce black's tension bishop e3 and, and black did oblige with g takes h4 and we have king h7 so this g file is it useful for black or for white bishop d4 rook g8 we have h5 is this another important outpost square you can imagine if a white rook goes there then it's lateral pressure on d6 which is already under fire we have bishop e8 is this pawn loose though this is the the trade-off surely the downside is uh the h5 pawn looks loose here to set up the g6 outpost square and now b4 is played bishop b8 a5 rook b7 and both pawns are now hit this discovers an attack on the pawn we have just the calm knight e3 here uh, and the response from houdini was bishop d7 you might wonder why is this on rook takes b4 can you see what white has if i give you five seconds to pause the video white to play here okay the bishop on d4 is not just pretty it's very dangerous after rook c7 check uh, black would have to give up on g7 a rook and that's horrible for black and alternatively bishop takes h5 rook c8 is really awkward uh, for black this kind of scenario uh, blacks fall into bits and if ever black takes then that traps the b8 bishop to prisoner there about to be eliminated uh, pretty soon so white gets a big advantage in those lines so bishop d7 was played bishop b6 and it looks as though black <laughs> black has prisoner pieces anyway especially the bishop on b8 is really looking terrible white dominates that c file the knight is beautifully central if this is the kind of positional domination alistine is capable of 
Anistin could be a major competitor for Leela in the next TSEC. We could see uh, yeah, a battle of neural networks at this rate. Anistin is really showing superb positional uh, judgment in this game from the Smith Morrow gambit. So bishop e8. Uh, we have rook c8. Bishop takes h5. A pair of rooks come off. Now that pawn is taken, which means e4 is now weakened. Black is pretty helpless here. This bishop on b8 doesn't bode well in particular. Now e4 is hit. Uh, we have the knight retreating. King g8. If rook takes f4, then this is pretty bad for black. That that bishop is basically being uh, chat mated. And this bishop holds e3. So that's not good. So uh, we have King G8, King G3 holding F4 officially, and that E4 is taken. And this looks abysmal. This endgame now after F5, it's absolutely crushing. Black has no real counterplay here. And let's see how the game finishes. So in this competition, it's uh, B5 wins a piece because of A6, A7. Basically, and it's too dangerous just to allow taking an a7. So that is taken. So the, it, the advantage is just increasing for white. Winning a piece here with a7. Uh, check and bishop c3. And here, after king f7, it was auto adjudicated as a win for white. Both engines thought it was plus 10 at this point for more than 10 ply. I, think, I believe that's the rule. So, uh, yeah, Smith Morigami from an engine perspective. Uh, so this Smith Mora, you can say in, in this Schaveningen structure, uh, which as I say, there's there's a book at Chasuble. I want to check this out, a course rather, an online course. So check that out. There's the the video I did, which is now featured at Chasuble. If you I want to check to out the uh, intro video there. So there's the link. Uh, but a fantastic neural network game example, I thought. And in fact, there's another fantastic example I'm going to show. Uh, soon, where Esman himself is playing against Leela, believe it or not. So that's coming soon on this channel as well. Something to look out for. Uh, how how the uh, neural networks play with these gamuts. Uh, so yeah, lessons to learn from this game. The two to one pool majority, I think, was emphasised with offering the exchange of queens. Uh, the end game seemed to be miserable, especially for the dark square bishop in this particular game. And yeah, White had superior pieces and was able then to win material. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. And check out the Chessable course. Okay, thanks very much.